Hi, everybody, and thank you for joining us for the July 2019 edition of the Data Architecture Virtual Group. Uh, today, we've got Glenn Berry talking about high, high availability and disaster recovery. Uh, very happy to have Glenn from SQL Skills here with us today. Uh, my name is Kenny Neal, and I am one of the co-leaders of this chapter, along with my partner, Rob Canzanieri. Uh, you can see our Twitter handles there and some email addresses if you want to get in touch with us. Uh, we're always looking for new speakers, so if you're interested in speaking to the group, just reach out to us at one of those addresses, and we'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, some upcoming meetings we've got. Uh, next month, we've got Ryan Adams talking about CMS and policy-based management. Uh, happy to have Ryan back. It's been a while for him. And then in October, Tim Radney from SQL Skills is going to be joining us to talk about managed instances. I think we've got something in the works for September, but we're still waiting on details there, so just watch your email for any information about that. And we're happy to be sponsored by Nutanix again, um, and also by HBR. They're continuing their sponsorship of the group. Uh, thank them for their support. Uh, if you're going to Pass Summit in uh, November, you can use our discount code there and save $150 on your registration. Uh, Plus, that, that gives our group a little bit of kickback there. It's a nice to have we can give that money away at the end of the year. Uh, some upcoming virtual group webinars. We are one of many, many virtual groups. There's a virtual group for just about any topic and any language you can think of. Uh, here are just some of the upcoming ones. And then finally, SQL Saturdays, which are pretty near and dear to my heart. They are like little mini past summits, just a one-day free training uh, all over the world. Uh, I've highlighted in red there, ours in Baton Rouge coming up on August 17th. Really like it if you could join us for that. It's going to be a great event. And that is about as fast as I could go through that deck, Glenn. So I'm going to hand it over to you. And thank you for joining us, Glenn. All right, good work. All right, finally. So this is High Availability Disaster Recovery 101. I'm Glenn Berry from SQL Skills. There's my email right there. If anything comes up that you don't get answered during the session, please send me an email and I'll definitely get back to you. This is a little bit about my yay me slide. The important thing here is my Twitter handle. Twitter is a really good resource for the SQL Server community. So you can get a lot of answers from technical questions and get to know people in the community. And this is about SQL skills. We've got six people working here and we do consulting and training and we speak at events. And then I know how to brew beer. I'm a pretty serious home brewer. So that's my cart that I use to make five gallon all green batches of beer. And that's what some of my beer looks like. And that's some of the uh, medals I've won from homebrew competitions. So that's enough about beer for now. So what we're gonna talk about right now is why do you have downtime and data loss? And what can you do when you're planning an HA strategy to try to prevent that from happening? And we'll talk about the different things you have available in SQL Server 2017, different HA technologies. And we'll talk about disaster recovery strategies and disaster recovery methods. So that's a lot to cover in a short one hour session. So what does HA actually mean? Well, it means that something is actually protected from different kinds of bad things happening. And it's able to be used as expected no matter what happens. So in our context, it's usually a database that's behind a website or an application, and it's, it means the database is available to service the website or the application. And this something, whatever it might be, is protected by various different technologies and techniques to try to prevent it from ever becoming unavailable. So you might protect your database with database mirroring or an availability group so that if something bad happens, you can come up on another node fairly rapidly. And the idea is that your users and applications just keep working no matter what bad things happen. But this something that you're trying to protect can be different things depending on what really is the context here. So the something might be, it could just be a single table in a particular database. And that's fairly unusual to be that narrow, but in that case, you could use transactional replication to protect that one table and have that table replicated to another database, another instance. More often, it's one or more databases. So you could protect a group of databases that have to go and fail over together with an availability group if you've got SQL Server 2012 or newer. And you might be worried about just protecting an entire server or just an instance of SQL Server. And in that case, you might use 
relatively old fashioned failover clustering to do that. You also might be worried about protecting an entire data center from a natural disaster, for example. So you might use SAN replication to do that. And the main causes of downtime can be broken down into planned downtime and unplanned downtime. And it's really important that you kind of keep that distinction clear in your heads because a lot of people have things like bonuses and reviews measured against their metrics for downtime. So the reasons for planned downtime, a lot of times you have to take planned downtime when you're doing database maintenance. So if you're using SQL Server Standard Edition, you don't have online index operations. So if you have to go and create an index on a very large table, if you do that, it's gonna lock up the table. And that might be you know, for quite a long time, depending on how fast your storage is and how big the table is. So a lot of people will take an outage just to do that. Whereas you wouldn't have to do that with Enterprise Edition. Another reason you might have to do uh, planned downtime is a large batch operation. So if you've got to go and delete, you know, hundreds of millions of rows from a table, the best way to do it that would be most rapid would be just do it in a set based operation, but that's going to lock up the table. So some people will take an outage just to do it, or you could write something that just sort of nibbles away at those hundreds of millions of rows and it takes a lot longer to do, but you might not have to take an outage for that. But probably the, the most frequent reason for planned downtime is doing some sort of an upgrade. So you're installing a SQL Server service pack or CU or installing Windows updates or updating drivers or firmware on your machine. And this is another place where if you have an HA technology in place, you can minimize your downtime because you can do what are called rolling upgrades. So for example, if you've got availability group set up, you can go and patch the secondary replicas and if necessary, bounce those nodes and then come back and then you can fail over and patch the normally primary replica and you can do this so that you have a lot shorter cumulative downtime as part of your patching and i'm a big proponent by the way of trying to stay up to date with sql server service packs and cus of course with sql server 2017 there's no service packs it's nothing but cumulative updates because i see so many people that are way way behind and they have a lot more problems generally speaking as a result and Microsoft actually wants you to proactively patch your servers. They've changed their guidance from years ago. So anyways, that's probably the most common reason you'll have planned outages. And then unplanned downtime, you might, depending on where you live and what part of the world or what part of the United States, if you're here in the US, you might have a natural disaster like a flood or a tropical storm coming in from the Gulf of Mexico that's gonna hit you in Louisiana, perhaps. And so you might lose your entire data center because of a natural disaster, or it could be a fire or extended power loss. One of the more, more frequent reasons people lose entire data centers, at least temporarily, is somebody goes with, say, a backhoe and digs up an internet cable outside of the data center. But that doesn't happen that often, but it depends where you live. You have different things to worry about. Another fairly common reason to have unplanned downtime is your entire server fails. Maybe it's just something simple like a power supply or the operating system crashes and it won't come back up. That doesn't happen as much as it used to years ago, but it still happens fairly often. A more common reason is something with your IO subsystems or one or more drive fails or a RAID controller fails or there's something wrong with your IO subsystem at the software level. And that's really the most common reason you have database corruption is something with your IO subsystem. But by far the most common reason for unplanned downtime is just human error. You know, anybody who's been a DBA has probably made a mistake at one point where they accidentally dropped a table in production or deleted a bunch of data they didn't, didn't mean to. And so that's the most common reason by far that you have problems and you need to think about that. What are the most common reasons you have downtime and then what can you do as you're planning your HADR strategy to try to prevent that and have a way to recover from that as quickly as possible if it does happen. Now, planning an HA strategy, what most people do, and it's the wrong thing to do, unfortunately, is they just go out and pick what they think is the latest and greatest HA technology. So availability groups is the new, relatively new, shiny thing. And they just decide, okay, we need an availability group. And that might not be the best solution for your 
workload, for example, or your skill set and experience level. And what you want to do instead of picking your favorite technology is figure out by talking to the business explicitly what your recovery point objective is that you're trying to meet RPO and your recovery time objective, RTO. And you need to have this conversation with the business. You can't just decide on your own. And you have to decide and, and talk to them about it because if you don't, they're gonna assume that your RPO is zero and your RTO is nearly zero. And again, what recovery point objective means is how much data can you lose in terms of time before it's a, a big issue for the business is basically the down to earth definition of RPO. And of course, when you go to the business and ask them that question, they're gonna come back and say zero, we can't lose any data, it would be the end of the world. And if they say, and they're serious about that, you need to say, okay, well, that's almost impossible to get zero RPO. But if you wanna get as close to zero as possible, I'll put together a plan and a budget for how we can try to do that. And let's talk about it next week. And then when you go back to them with your plan and your budget, quite often they'll say, hey, wait a minute, we can't, we can't afford that. What can you do? And so you need to go through this and come up with whatever it turns out to be. So say it's five minutes as your RPO, because that's really important as you design your HA architecture and decide on how often to take backups, for example. And then recovery time objective is how long does it take you to recover when a particular failure occurs? So if somebody drops a table in production, how long would it take you to recover from that? If you lose an entire server, how long would it take to recover from that? And so you need to come up with a list of the most likely things that you think might happen and then come up with an estimate. Okay, how long would it take me to recover from that? And then talk to the business and find out, is this okay or not? If, if, if we lost this server, we'd be down for two weeks waiting for a new server. Is that okay or not? Or do we have a spare server we could use in an emergency? And so you need to go through and get this hammered out so you know what you're trying to meet in terms of your SLAs. And it's also really important when you're specifying uptime, whether or not it includes maintenance windows or not. And so you may have heard of, you know, three nines and four nines and five nines availability. So this little chart right here shows you how much downtime you're allowed per year and per month and per week with these different levels of nines of availability. And doing three and four nines is not super difficult, but five nines is extremely difficult in real life because that's you know less than six minutes of downtime per year is five nines. And that's pretty hard to meet, even if you have rolling upgrades if you're doing any kind of patching whatsoever, you're gonna have brief outages as you're going back and forth. And so over the course of the year, you'll probably burn through five minutes worth fairly easily. And if you have one unplanned incident, you can easily blow that five minutes. And again, that's over the course of an entire year. So here's sort of a list of SQL Server 2017 HA related technologies. And the first two things on the list aren't actually technologies, they're just stuff you need to think about for database servers as opposed to say web servers. So we'll go through this entire list, but that's what we're gonna cover. And the first thing, no matter what else you're doing with any kind of fancy backup appliance or anything else that might be in your organization, you need to make sure that you've got a good backup and restore and recovery strategy in place for your databases. And the first part of this is deciding what recovery model to use for your databases. And in most cases, you're gonna be in full recovery model. If you're worrying about HADR, you're probably gonna to have to use full recovery model. And many of the SQL Server technologies for HA require you to be in full recovery model at all times. But you need to decide on what recovery model and decide on purpose, don't just assume something is the way it should be. And I see a lot of accidental DBAs who don't even really know what a recovery model is, much less which one to pick. So make sure you figured out which one you need to use and then have a backup strategy in place that will help allow you to meet your RPO. So if you've got a five minute RPO and you're taking transaction log backups every two hours, it's very unlikely you're gonna be able to meet that five minute RPO unless you get very lucky because you are very likely to lose 
everything sends the last transaction log back up if you can't back up the tail of the log, for example. So that's going to drive how often you take transaction log backups. And then using differential backups, a lot of people don't do that. But having those in place can help you tighten up your RTO because you can skip restoring a bunch of log backups and get back online more quickly if you're restoring from backup. And then there's things like backup compression and using backup checksums and then using the backup tuning options like max transfer size and buffer count and things like that so that you can get faster backups in many cases. And you need to experiment with that on your larger databases. It can actually make a big difference. And then a recovery strategy. This is what a lot of people ignore because they take backups, but they very rarely, if ever, restore and recover those databases to make sure their backups are actually good. And just today, in fact, we got an email at SQL Skills from somebody who has a corrupt database and they went to restore from their backups and they figured out their backups are no good. So it's basically game over. And we get emails like this every week or so with some desperate DBA. And so don't let that happen to you. It's really important to test restoring your backups and have an automated process in place to do that. And using instant file initialization and having backup compression in place usually will restore, reduce your restore times. It's also real important to keep your VLF counts low because that reduces the recovery portion of the restore. So after it uh, does the restore, then it goes through a recovery process and that can take many extra minutes if you've got really high VLF counts. All right, so here is a little bit more information about the backup tuning options. So you've got buffer count, and block size and max transfer size as optional parameters. And if you're using transparent database encryption, on old versions of SQL Server, that did not play well with backup compression. But with SQL Server 2016, you can use the two together, but it's really important that you set max transfer size to larger than 64K, or else you won't get any backup compression with the TDE database. And this backup command here just has an example of setting buffer count and block size and max transfer size. And what I'm saying here, and this is a striped backup, by the way, in this example, but you should experiment with this on your larger databases and figure out, do these help or not? Because I've seen this knock 20, 30% off a of backup elapsed time on some large databases. And it depends on your storage and your data, what numbers are gonna be the best for you. And so another thing that you should be in the habit of doing, in my opinion, is have a secondary restore server. So a lot of people don't run DBCC check DB because they're worried about how long it takes and the load it puts on their production server. And so some of my clients have a, a process in place so that after they take their full backups, they take that full backup and restore it on this secondary server. And that's the only way you really know for sure that the backup is good is by restoring it. All the other things you can do, like restore, verify, header only, don't really tell you that it's good. And so after you restore it, then you can run DBCC check DB on that secondary server. And if it runs into a problem, then you can run it again on your production server. But this takes the main load off of your production server. And this would be a non-production use in my mind, at least. And so you can automate most of this with scripts so that way it's running all the time and you know that your backups are good. So you won't be like this poor guy who emailed us today. So another one that's really important in my mind is component redundancy, because this is a database server. It's a mission critical asset, and it's not like a web server. And so you wanna make sure that you have redundant components in that database server. So for example, when you order most rack mount servers, you can get one power supply or two or even four on some models. So make sure you've got multiple power supplies that are actually plugged into separate circuits, not all in the same circuit. And you've got multiple network ports that are going to network switches that are separate. And you've got an appropriate level of RAID for all your logical drives. And then you've got hot swappable components, which most rack mount servers have. And then also having some cold spares. So if you've got the same model SSD or hard drive in, in your database servers, have one or two of those sitting in your cage just ready to go. So if you lose a component, you can replace it immediately 
and then worry about getting the cold spare replaced from your vendor, and that's going to take longer in most cases. And this is just cheap insurance because all of these failover technologies we're going to talk over later have a failover duration. And if you can avoid having to do that because you lost a power supply, that's going to help your overall uptime statistics. So again, this component redundancy would just cost not very much compared to your SQL Server licenses is cheap insurance against an unplanned failover because all these HADR technologies take some time to fail over. A traditional failover cluster instance, you've got to move the cluster resources to the other node and then start SQL Server on that new node. And usually that entire process takes 30, 60, 90 seconds, sometimes longer. And you can avoid that. And then if you have an availability group or you're using database mirroring, you've got to do a database property change and then replay whatever was in the redo queue on the other side. And so that's going to usually take 10, 15 seconds, sometimes less. And then log shipping is a manual failover. And so all those things take some time and you want to avoid that if possible for an unplanned failover. And again, spend the small amount of extra money to make your database server as robust as possible. And the amount of money that this takes is very, very trivial. But again, you're going to often get pushback from your financial people. Oh, we don't want to spend that money. We don't need that. You know, we're doing database mirroring. Why do we need more redundant components? All right. So Windows failover clustering. This is an older technology that still works very well. And you know, if you're on a modern version of Windows, like uh, Windows Server 2019, it works extremely well. And it's a SQL Server failover cluster on a Windows Server failover cluster. And you've got multiple nodes, you know, a minimum of two, but often more than that. And then one or more instances of SQL Server installed across those different nodes. And you have to have shared storage with a failover cluster. And that shared storage is a single point of failure. And usually it's going to be a SAN. And of course, the SAN vendor will tell you, oh, the SAN can never fail. It's got quadruple redundancy and it never would ever fail. But it, SANs do actually fail. And you can use other things like SIOS Data Keeper instead of using a SAN. You can use things like uh, Storage Spaces Direct. So there's other alternatives to SANs for this. And you have the ability to have TempDB on each node instead of on the shared storage to get better performance. And this gives you instance level high availability. So all the databases, all the system databases, the user databases, all the things like logins and agent jobs and linked servers, they're all protected automatically. And if you make changes and add more databases over time, they're all automatically protected. So this is a really good solution for shops that don't have a dedicated DBA or don't have experience with availability groups. It's much, much easier to manage after you get the failover cluster set up. Again, the downside of this is the failover takes longer and that can be a big deal for some uh, applications. And keeping your VLF counts under control will make your failover go more quickly. And then the other downside of this is that the shared storage is a single point of failure. And if you're using a SAN like most people will, SAN performance, shared SAN performance can be inconsistent. And so I sort of don't like that, but I still recommend failover clustering for a lot of people because it's just so easy once it's initially set up. Now, moving TempDB to local storage, a lot of times when you do have shared storage, TempDB can be a problem because it puts a lot of load on the SAN and you don't get very good TempDB performance. And you have the option since SQL Server 2012 of moving TempDB to your local node. And you can do that and put it on very fast local flash storage on the node, or even better, Intel Optane storage. This stuff is not the same as NAND flash. It's better, much, much better, much lower latency, much better performance under a heavy write load. And I've had a number of my clients move TempDB from their SAN to Optane storage on the node and, and their world was just changed because you get much better TempDB performance and you take that TempDB workload off of the SAN so everything else works better. And 
These are not super expensive, by the way. They're a little bit more expensive than NAND flash, but not crazy expensive. And this is a little bit more about Intel Optane DC storage. It's 3D Crosspoint is what the name of the technology is. And these come in PCIe add-in cards, or they also come in U2, two and a half inch drive form factors. And they have three different capacities. And the nice thing about this, you can use any version of SQL Server with this. It doesn't have to be SQL Server 2016 or newer. And it just gives you much lower latency and better durability and better random IO performance at low Q depths. And it doesn't go downhill as it gets close to being full like regular NAND flash. So it works really well if you've got a super intense TempDB workload. So here's what one of those cards looks like. And I don't work for Intel, but this is just a great product if you have a big TempDB bottleneck. All right, so the next technology that I'll talk about is availability groups. And this came out in SQL Server 2012. And this is just, it requires the Windows failover cluster feature, at least until the latest versions of SQL Server, but it doesn't require shared storage. So you don't have to use a SAN with this. And it was enterprise edition only until SQL Server 2016. And all the databases that are gonna be in availability groups have to use the full recovery model at all times. You can't be switching to bulk log, for example. And an availability database is just one of your user databases that's in an availability group. And you've got the primary database that's your read-write copy, and you only have one. And then you can have multiple secondary databases on other nodes that can be read-only or non-readable, just for HA purposes. And in SQL Server 2012, you could have only four replicas but now you can have eight replicas and you have the ability to offload read-only activity onto your readable replicas, but unfortunately you can't make any schema changes on those. So you can't add extra indexes to make reporting queries run better. And so when this first was announced, I was like, oh great, we can stop using replication for reporting. But that's really not the case in most uh, people's scenarios because Again, you need those extra indexes for reporting queries. So that is kind of how it works. And you also have basic availability groups. And that was added as a new feature in SQL Server 2016 Standard Edition. And that is meant as a replacement for database mirroring, which was deprecated in SQL Server 2012. It still works. But anyways, this lets you have a primary database with one replica and the replica is not readable. So it's very much like database mirroring. The one advantage you have with the basic availability group is that it can have a synchronous replica or an asynchronous replica. And in database mirroring, if you were on standard edition, you could only use synchronous. You couldn't do an asynchronous. And the limitations here is you just have the one replica and there's no read access on the secondary. You can't take backups on the secondary and only one database is in a basic availability group. So it's just like database mirroring. And if you have standard edition and you upgrade to enterprise edition, you're gonna to to tear down your availability groups and redo them. They won't upgrade in place. And these only work on standard edition. So if you had enterprise edition, you wouldn't wanna use these anyways. You'd rather use a regular availability group. So database mirroring has been around since SQL Server 2005 and it gives you database level high availability. And it was deprecated in SQL Server 2012, so a lot of people just quit using it, but that's not necessarily the right thing because it still works and there's no kill switch in it. It's not gonna quit working at some point in the future. And it's still in the product in SQL Server 2019. There were rumors that Microsoft was gonna take it out in SQL Server 2017, but then they backed out and I've heard privately from Microsoft people that they'll probably never take it out. So if database mirroring works for you and you're familiar with it, you can keep on using it. And you've got a principal database and then a mirror database that are on separate instances of SQL Server that typically are on different machines. And the principal database is the writable copy and then the mirror is a non-readable copy. And your, all your databases that are in database mirroring have to be in full recovery model at all times. And then you have to pick, do you want synchronous mirroring or asynchronous mirroring? And you can only use asynchronous mirroring with enterprise edition. 
And if you want automatic failover with database mirroring, you have to use synchronous mirroring, plus you have to have a witness instance, so you have a quorum for an automatic failover. And asynchronous is only an enterprise edition. The reason you would ever use asynchronous in most cases is because of performance. If your mirror instance is very far away geographically or it has slower storage, then you're probably going to have to use asynchronous mode most of the time or else you're going to get a lot of latency from a two-phase commit. And you only have one database that's mirrored at a time to just one location, which is your mirror. All right, transactional replication. Replication is another thing you can use for HA. A lot of people don't think of it that way, but you can actually replicate an entire database. And once you've got it replicated, you can have multiple subscribers in different locations. And you can use those subscribers for reporting or for HA or for both. And the source database is a publisher, and then the destination databases are subscribers. And you've got a log reader agent that picks up all the write activity from the publisher. So that's going to add some extra I.O. workload to that log file. And then all those changes that are coming from that get stored in a distribution database, which might be local on the publisher. But sometimes people will have a dedicated uh, distribution instance and that takes that distribution database load off of the publisher instance. And again, multiple subscribers in multiple locations, and you can add more indexes to subscribers, so it's pretty handy. And if you've been used replication in the past, they actually went through and, and added a lot of improvements in SQL Server 2017, and they continue to do that in cumulative updates. So replication is not a dead technology, and it can be useful for HA purposes. So here's some of the improvements in SQL Server 2017. They made it so that you can have the distribution database in an availability group before you had to use a failover cluster instance to protect it. And you, you can also dynamically reload your agent profile parameters without having to restart the agent for things like the log reader agent. And also it takes care of cleaning up the distribution database much better than with older versions. And they continue to add actual product improvements, not just bug fixes in SQL Server 2017 CUs, because remember, they don't have service packs anymore. So if you're one of those shops who, oh, we don't do CUs, you need to get over that because you're going to be way, way behind and miss out on a lot of improvements in the product. All right, peer-to-peer -peer replication is just another form of transactional replication that gives you database level protection. And with this, you can have multiple writable copies of your database. So that sounds pretty cool. And these can be in different data centers. And as you make a change to one of the peer databases, it's sent to all the other peers, and they eventually, usually within a couple minutes, synchronize. And so a lot of times this is used for scalability purposes. So you split that write workload across different databases on different instances. But the problem is, is that peer-to-peer -peer replication is a little bit harder to set up and maintain. And quite often, you've got to go in and make some changes to your database. So for example, if you use identity columns in your tables, well, if you had multiple writable copies, those identities would collide with each other. So you can actually reserve blocks of identity values for the different writable copies of your database. But that's the kind of thing you might have to change to use this. And it only works on Enterprise Edition, and I see very few people using this, but that's just one of the things you do have available to you. Log shipping is another HA slash DR technology that gives you database level protection, just like most of the other ones here. And you can have multiple copies of a log ship database in multiple locations. And your databases have to be in full recovery model at all times. So you see a theme here. You have to have a manual failover, although you can write some code to kind of somewhat automate it. And it's possible to lose some data with log shipping because you could lose everything since the last transaction log backup that was copied over off of the main server. And so that's why log shipping is usually used for DR, but it's better than nothing for HA. And I've got a lot of smaller clients who just use log shipping and nothing else. And so, you can also use log shipping to protect against user error. So if somebody goes in and drops a table, you can have one of your log ship copies 
have a, a restore delay of say four hours. So somebody drops a table and then they fess up before that four hour window has gone away, you can go to that log ship copy and get the data before it gets blown away by uh, you know, a transaction log backup that comes later. And the other nice thing about log shipping is that you can layer it on top of other things. So you could be using availability groups for local HA and then log ship to a different data center for some DR capability. And log shipping doesn't add any extra performance overhead like most of the other things do because you're in full recovery model, so you have to take log backups. And all log shipping is doing is automating taking log backups and copying it over somewhere else and restoring it somewhere else. So it's not putting any extra load on your main writable copy of your database. So don't just dismiss log shipping as primitive or old fashioned, it's very useful. So database snapshots is another thing you can use. And that just means you take a point in time snapshot and it creates a snapshot file. And then that snapshot file grows over time to track the changes since the snapshot. And so it's only available in Enterprise Edition until SQL Server 2016 SP1, and they put it in the Standard Edition. But as people will use this for reporting purposes, or you can also take a snapshot of a database mirror, which is not a good idea, by the way. Some people will take a snapshot before they push out a bunch of changes to their database. If it all goes terribly bad, they could revert to the snapshot. So snapshots can be useful. You also have SAN snapshots with most SANs, which is all, also can be useful. But just keep in mind that snapshots are worthless without the main database that they're based on. So don't have this false sense of security that snapshot is the same as a backup. It, it, it is not. All right, so here's a little chart that just shows you the various HA features and whether they're available in different editions of SQL Server. And as you can see, Enterprise Edition lets you do everything. And then Standard Edition has a few restrictions, although most of those were lifted in SQL Server 2016. And then Express Edition, you basically can't do anything except be a subscriber for replication and a witness for database mirroring, but all these other things don't work in Express Edition. So how do you go about planning a disaster recovery strategy? Well, what you wanna do is make sure you've got database backups because they're your last line of defense. And if everything else fails, you can eventually get back online and have all your data if you've got good backups that you know that you can restore. But you need to make sure that you've got a disaster recovery strategy that can be followed when you have a disaster. And you need to have it in there what databases and what applications have to be brought online first, you know, paying attention to your data loss SLA and your downtime SLA. And this should be decided on ahead of time so it's not everybody fighting in the disaster about getting their application up first. And a good disaster recovery plan needs to be written by your most senior people, but then tested by the most junior people because they're the ones who are probably gonna be on duty late at night or on a weekend or during a holiday. And it also should be detailed enough so that a non-DBA, so maybe a network admin or a developer, if your DBA isn't available, could they possibly execute this? And it needs to be very comprehensive and detailed. You can't just say something like, restore the database from backups. That's not good enough. It's not enough detail. You need to have a lot more detail about, okay, Here's where the backups are stored, and here's the, uh, the, the file name pattern, and here's a sample script for how to do a restore, you know, do the full restore with no recovery, and then the differential with no recovery, and then the log backups with no recovery, you know, and a sample script. And what if something goes wrong? They try to run the very first restore, and they get an error message. Which, what do they do? Call Glenn? Or do they have some sort of troubleshooting information? Okay, if you get this error, here's something you can try. The more information you have in there is helpful for you, plus anybody else who's trying to follow this plan. Plus, you need to think about the human factors, especially in a widespread disaster. You know, if a hurricane comes in and takes out uh, New Orleans, do you think the people in New Orleans, your employees, are going to be worried about getting your database back online? Are they more worried about their families and their house and things like that? 
And so, for example, Jonathan, who used to work at Outback Steakhouse's corporate headquarters near Tampa, they had at, at OSI, what they would do is when a hurricane was coming into Florida, they would put all the senior IT people plus their families on a plane and fly them to their secondary data center somewhere much further inland and put them in a hotel. And then they could worry about doing their job and they knew their families were safe. And that's the kind of thing you need to think about if you live someplace where natural disasters are relatively common. And this plan should be tested. And every time you try to test it, you're going to find, oh, we forgot about that, or we didn't have that much information in there. So you update it after each test, so the plan gets better over time. Another thing you need to think about is, in a disaster recovery situation, is think about what problems might happen depending on what disaster actually occurred. So if the server is water damaged or fire damaged, what are you going to do? Do you have any extra servers? Can you get any? Can you go to your local micro center? and get a Dell server, actually you can. They sell some small uh, Dell servers, for example. You know, what if the SAN is physically damaged? What are you gonna do? What if there's no power at the data center? What if the entire data center is gone? Where are the offsite backups of your databases stored and can you get them back? What if your first database backups corrupt? Uh, a really important, what if your main DBA who knows how to do all this stuff is on vacation in Europe? and not available. Does anybody else have any clue about what they have to do to get the databases back online? People issues with DR planning. This is really important. When something bad is happening, who do you have to notify? You know, users, business people who, you know, have this in place. And then who's responsible at each phase of the recovery? So if you've got to stand up new servers or new VMs, who has to do that? And there should be somebody in your organization who's sort of the sponsor or stakeholder of all this. So that if different departments are kind of fighting over what needs to be done first and who gets what resources, who can resolve that? And then as you're going through this, who do you have to keep informed of how things are going? Because believe me, you're going to get lots of emails and people standing over your shoulder about what's going on. And then a, a really important one, if you've got two data centers or even just local HA and, and one data center, who has to authorize a failover? So if you've got a problem in your main data center and your website is offline, how long do you spend troubleshooting it before you decide to fail over? This needs to be decided and, and written down somewhere because if you spend too much time troubleshooting it, you're probably gonna get in trouble. But if you fail over after you know a minute, you'll probably get in trouble for failing over too quickly. And then who's in charge of the entire DR effort? And do you have contact info for everybody who has to become involved? And you're probably going to have other teams like networking and uh, storage and QA and business users that have to be involved to make sure that it's actually working. Because usually most DBAs know a little bit about their applications, but they don't know all the details. And so if, when you fail over to your secondary data center, you can go in and do what I call smoke testing and log in and see like, oh yeah, it looks like it's working. But then you'll probably figure out later that there's one thing Sally and accounting needs to get payroll out that's not working yet. So somebody from the business side has to go in after you've said, oh yeah, we're back up to confirm that yes, everything is working and we're happy. Otherwise you'll hear about it later. And so another thing you wanna to try to do with HADR is after you've built up your architecture, Test it before you go on production, if possible, with various things that you can think of. So what happens if you go to your main database server and just pull out a drive or unplug the entire server? Does it just crash or does it fail over like you would expect? And what happens if you drop a table or truncate a table? What happens? Can you fix that? And what we used to do at Avalara when I worked there is we would take uh, the receptionist from the corporate headquarters and, and take them over to the data center and say, okay, just go in and unplug something or turn something off. You pick. You, it's up to you. And they would do things that we never thought of, and that would help make our strategy better. And we would maybe change cabling or something like that to make the system more robust. Other things you want to try doing, just so you have an idea how long it takes, 
is what happens if you have to do a bare metal install on a fresh server out of the box, or you have to take a do a full restore from the backups of your largest database? How long does that take? Because believe me, in a crisis, your boss and their boss is literally going to be looking over your shoulder and asking you every five minutes, how long is it going to take? And you should have a decent idea of how long that's going to take. And if it turns out during your testing that you just can't meet your SLA requirements that you agreed to with the business, then you need to push back and say, I'm sorry, we just can't do this with these resources. We either need to back off the requirements or give us more resources, or maybe we can figure out something more clever, but make sure they know what you can actually do before you go on production. Otherwise, they're going to assume that you can meet the SLA that you agreed to. And then something that you should do, but hardly anybody actually does, unfortunately, is perform regular real-life DR testing in production. So some organizations where this is really a big deal, they'll just, with no warning, just fail over and then see what happens and see how long it takes them to come up. And the first couple of times they do it, it's a disaster. They have lots of problems, but then they figure out all their problems and streamline their plan and they get so that it's just second nature and they know that it all works. Because that's something else that I see a lot is people will set up an HA technology and then they're afraid to touch it. Because, oh no, if, if we fail over, we might be down for half an hour and we'll get in trouble and we're not really sure if it works. So we'll just set it up and hope we never have to use it. And that's the wrong way to look at it. All right, so just to summarize, HADR is more than just picking your favorite technology or feature. It's really, really important that you understand your RPO and RTO and the business understands that and you've agreed and make sure that the business understands your budget and infrastructure limitations. If they want a secondary data center, but you've only got a, a budget of $10,000 to set it up, that's just not realistic. And then if you don't remember anything else from this entire talk, make sure you've got a good backup and restore strategy in place, regardless of everything else, because that's your final line of defense. You know, if you can restore from your backups, you'll save the day by not losing any data. And again, you want to make sure you've got good database backups and you know that they're good by restoring them. And then finally, you can combine these different features. So like I said before, you could have failover clustering in your main data center and use log shipping to a secondary data center. Or you could use availability groups and combine it with log shipping, for example, to make your overall solution more robust. And so I've got some references here. I've got several Pluralsight courses about, I've got one on log shipping, one on database mirroring, another one on installing and configuring SQL Server 2016. And then Paul Randall wrote a white paper it's kind of old now, but it covers all the basic principles that I've talked about really well. The only thing it doesn't talk about is availability groups since they weren't in SQL Server 2008. And then I've got even more Pluralsight courses. And then the last two links here are a couple of Microsoft programs that are free that you can join to get lots of cool stuff for free, like MCP exam vouchers and Azure usage credits and Pluralsight subscriptions for free. So you might as well take advantage of that since Microsoft's paying for it. So finally, we've got the SQL Intersection Conference coming up in Las Vegas in November. So that's the last little plug here. So I've got some time for questions if you guys have any.